There's a slide in here about CALCASA. Um, so a little bit about who we are, um, California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Um, I did mean to include a slide in here about, about the Guam, Guam Coalition. Um, so um, just ignore the slide, but I'll go ahead and read a little bit from the disclaimer um, that the Guam Coalition has this provided, right? So this project was supported by grant number 2017-MUAX-004, awarded by the Office on Violence Against Women, U.S. Department of Justice, and a grant uh, G2001-GUSDVC, awarded by the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act, Administration for Children and Families, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this publication program exhibition are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of these funding agencies. Um, so again, this web conference series is being brought to you by the Guam Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Family Violence, um, and Cal Casa is excited to be here. Um, so the version of the slides that you'll receive will be the one that has um, this information in it. Um, uh, Emily, you're on vaccine slides. Uh, can you go to the Zoom? How do you Zoom? Thank you. Um, so I'll just get in a little bit into um, how do you Zoom? I'm pretty sure most folks are familiar, but I'll do a quick run through. Um, so we do have the text chat feature available, which folks have already been using. Um, so feel free to write any of your questions or reactions, um, as well as responses to some text chat questions we may have. Um, if you've just joined, please introduce yourselves, um, your pronouns, your organization, and what the weather is like in your neighborhood. Um, so as I've mentioned, the PowerPoint slides will be available later, right? I believe uh, the Guam Coalition will, uh, you know, place them on their website and can access them there. Um, um, and then this is also being recorded, so that will be made available as well. Um, we don't have, oh, we have one polling question for today. Um, so as we come, come along that slide, it will appear on your screen and you can participate on the poll from your devices. Um, for those of you who maybe cannot connect via audio phone or if you have any issues with the Wi-Fi or internet, um, please do dial on, on the dial through phone. Um, so there are some phone numbers that should have been available in the registration confirmation email that you received. Um, we do have closed captioning available. Um, so if you click on the CC or closed caption button in the bottom of the Zoom window um, next to where the chat and participant list are, um, then you'll be able to uh, you see the closed captioning, right? So thank you to our partners at Aberdeen Captioning for helping us with this. Um, and then I do believe that we have one breakout room discussion. So we'll, we'll go into breakout rooms. Um, they will be randomly assigned. Um, and you'll be able to unmute yourselves and a few par participants can share and discuss um, if time permitting. Okay. And throughout the presentation, feel free to use the raise hand feature um, and we will come to you as time permits and allow you to um, unmute yourself and ask any questions or participate. So again, uh, my name is Shelby Phillips. Um, I am the project and communication coordinator at CalCASA. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I've been with the organization now for about three years, um, helping out in the various projects here, and I am excited to be here with you all today. Okay. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to introduce our presenter, uh, Emily Austin, and pass over the virtual microphone to her um, and allow her to give you a little bit more about who she is. Um, I'll be along on today's session just to help out with any housekeeping. Um, if anything comes up, feel free to send me a private chat um, and I'll help doing housekeeping, troubleshooting. Um, yeah. Yeah, and Shelby's really good at interrupting me. So if you have a question, you've got to get in there, put it in the chat and Shelby will interrupt me as needed. Thank you so much, Shelby. I'm Emily Austin. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a consultant with CalCASA and I actually worked at CalCASA for several years and I've worked in the violence against women movement for over 18 years as both an advocate, an activist and a lawyer. So I went to law school to learn about 
social justice issues and became specialized in looking at policy around preventing sexual violence and creating better state and local policies and structures to support survivors. I'm really excited to join you all today um, and be able to engage in a more detailed discussion about sexual assault and rape culture in a way that encourages you to engage with unconscious bias you may hold, uh, recognize how systems may have been set up to oppress and recognize the needs of survivors through several, you know, pretty basic, simple tools. I created this web conference for Cal Casa to be kind of introduction to sexual assault as an issue. And it's an issue that is difficult to talk about because it is so complex and because it involves so much intimacy and um, often happens in a, in a place where there aren't a lot of witnesses. There's not a lot of community knowledge about sexual assault that is happening in individual spaces. So today uh, we're just going to really define sexual assault. I'm gonna talk about kind of what different types of definitions of sexual assault are. We're gonna understand the myths and realities of sexual violence. I have a lot of videos that, although not perfect, they do really allow us to have, dive into why this issue is so complex, why sexual violence is such a complex issue. Um, and I hope they're entertaining and it's a way to encourage dialogue. And then finally, we're gonna go through a framework of three things you can do to support survivors. You do not need to be an expert in sexual violence to be supportive of people who have experienced sexual violence. And I hope that is a takeaway you have after the web conference today. Uh, Cal Casa is very dedicated to providing trauma-informed care, and part of that is to pause here and examine that there, we're going to be talking about sexual violence, which can be triggering for many people, and I want to share this trauma-informed care warning with you that this content may impact you, this could trigger feelings, emotions, or even physical responses. And we urge you to take care of yourself, to step away if you need to, to turn down the sound, to reach out for support. None of the videos or content is especially graphic or intense, but it can still, depending on your circumstances and your experience, it can still trigger emotions and feelings. I would just also just put a pause here that during these moments and times right now, we're facing a major election, we're facing social justice issues that are raising and heightening our awareness everywhere. And part of this training is about recognizing how to take care of yourself and encouraging you to do that. And so I don't take offense to not having video on or if you need to step away or you need to leave the conference, we really wanna make this as trauma-informed as possible. So as a warm-up, I know it's morning in Guam. Um, I wanted to start by having you all talk in breakout rooms of about five or six people, uh, about 10 breakout rooms I'm thinking. How have you interacted with survivors of sexual violence in your work? You may, work directly with survivors as advocates. You may work in the criminal justice system. You may work as a teacher or educator or a preventionist. I'd love you to just share in your small groups how you've interacted with survivors of sexual violence in your work. Have you had contact with them? And what's that been like? So I think Shelby's gonna start our breakout rooms for us. You should get a pop out inviting you to a breakout room. And we're gonna talk for about five minutes in the small groups and then we'll come back. All right, I'll see you in five minutes.
and I would love to hear if anyone um, wanted to share some of the ways folks in their group have been interacting with survivors of sexual violence. If you want to unmute or you can always put it in the chat. If anyone wants to share, I'll put it in the chat, um, how um, their group has been interacting with survivors. I'd love to hear your voices or uh, see your responses in the chat. Um, good morning, my name is Gwen. Um, I, I'm a victim advocate and I have worked directly with victims of um, sexual assault uh, in the age ranges. The youngest I remember being around 15 or somewhere around 15 years old and, and the oldest was in her 70s. Um, and when I say direct services, those particular victims, both at our local um, hospital, uh, all the way to the point where I dropped them back to a safe, uh, safe place for them, whether it was their shelter or, or a home, a family member's home. And you were working with them as a crisis response, right? So responding to the hospital and supporting them as advocates through that process. Yes, um, with, one, with one particular victim from the hospital uh, to as well as where police officers came in to take her, her report. Um, pick up her clothing for evidence, getting her to our Healing, Heart, Heart, excuse me, our Healing Hearts Crisis, um, Rape Crisis Center. And um, again, back home and the next day, working with her um, and the Guam Police Department and getting, um, getting her to the location of, of the assault, um, really closely working with her. Thank you. You're, you're our first responder. <laughs> Thank you for that service. No um, others, anyone work with survivors in a different capacity? Um, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I work with the survivors at the shelter at times because I I was uh, fortunate to to um, be stationed at the shelter, at a woman's shelter, battle shelter, sexual assault, and also human trafficking. And um, sometimes the survivors, especially for the sexual assault, they would like even if we don't ask them, they would like to share their experience because uh, I believe it's it's like one way for them to cope up because they want to listen to their, uh, to, for others to listen to their experience. And when they talk about it, they're, they're, they're always in tears and I'm emotionally moved every time I listen to them. Each of them have a unique experience and, and uh, uh, after they talk about it, they still have, you know, the courage to smile. And that's what I really admire on, on the survivors because, uh, mm -hmm after they talk about it, they will be relieved and they will smile because they, they were able to survive that and, and the experience that they have at uh, the shelter, which uh, is uh, for them sometimes is not expected because they think that nobody else is able to help them. Nobody else is able to pull them out from uh, the way or from the experience that they had. Right. Um, and that listening piece is so critical. Uh, we'll talk about that more today, but you guys are, you're already coming up with the tools that we wanted to cover as frontline responders to survivors of sexual violence. Have other folks worked with survivors, maybe within their family or uh, within educational system, maybe not directly through victim advocacy? Anyone want to share how they may have come in contact with survivors of sexual violence?
Um, I'll share. I have worked with people in my own family that have been victims and needed help making a plan to escape that situation. Um, and at that point, I didn't know a lot about helping victims. And so I wish I would have known what I know now. Fabulous. Thank you. And this also kind of webinar is set up for folks that feel like they don't have a clue of how to respond to support survivors because we know survivors are all around us. We know one in five, depending on the statistics and the areas, between one in three and one in five women will experience sexual violence in their lifetime. And between one in six and one in 14 men will experience sexual violence during their lifetime. So we know when we're in a group of six or more people, uh, 14 or more people, that we know that just basically by the numbers, there are survivors all around us. And our society can do a much better job in supporting survivors and um, empowering them to make choices in their own healing. Thank you all, everyone, for sharing. Uh, I just wanted to start today with a little bit of your voices and your experience here. And I really encourage you to raise your hand, interrupt, get, get questions into the chat and make sure we get your answers, um, your questions answered. And make sure if you have something that you want to, where you want to go further, let me know so I can help. I wanted to start today with a little bit of a, a shared definition about sexual violence because sexual violence means different things in different situations. It means different things in different jurisdictions, um, areas of control. Um, and the different definitions don't necessarily serve all survivors. So I wanted to start with a general definition that means that sexual assault is any type of sexual conduct or behavior that occurs without the consent of the recipient. And we'll go further into what consent looks like, sounds like, feels like uh, as we go on. But consent is a pivotal um, part of a community definition of sexual assault. Sexual assault occurs when a person is forced, coerced, or manipulated into any unwanted sexual activity. So it doesn't have to be perpetration of genitals. It doesn't have to be exposure of genital area. It can be unwanted touching, motions, figures, uh, fig uh, in inappropriate images, these things are all forms of a broader definition of sexual assault. I did pull up Guam's, um, this is the first degree sexual violence definition in the criminal justice system because it differs from kind of the community definition of sexual assault I introduced. And this is very specific uh, to engaging in sexual penetration with the victim and if any of these circumstances exist. So you'll see right away, the, the legalese is more detailed and very specific as to what qualifies as first degree sexual violence in the Guam territory. I would also say that just looking briefly at the, the laws in your jurisdiction, there are various levels of degrees of sexual violence. And this is the, the highest uh, degree. The, the first degree is the most, uh, has the largest penalties. And then there are lesser degrees as well. But our community definition doesn't get into the specifics. It really leaves more with general terms of what would be considered sexual content, contact or behavior. It doesn't spell that out. It doesn't spell out exactly what consent is and it doesn't define forced, coerced or manipulated. So a community definition has a lot more room to understand what we're gonna see as a continuum of sexual violence. I wanted to include this kind of brain storm as well because sexual violence and assault includes a range of behaviors as our community definition underlined. 
and it co comes from physical forms of sexual violence and then also forms that are sexual harassment, uh, catcalling, inappropriate jokes, moving to a more physical places of unwanted touching and forced touching, um, pressured sexual activity. So we're really talking about a continuum. And I'm gonna share a video that talks a little bit about these forms of sexual assault as a continuum, including sexual violence. Just wait for technology for one minute. And if someone would just give me a thumbs up that they can hear the video when it starts, that would be fabulous. Here we go. Oh, sure, that's a great idea. Um, but I'm not sure if Nicole is into horror films. Let me just ask her. Nicole? Hey, Nicole, you wanna watch Werewolf vs. Zombie Vampire 6? Okay, well, she didn't say no, so count us in. Sexual consent means that both people are actively willing to engage in a particular sexual behavior and express their consent by saying, yes, that's okay with me. But just because someone consents to engage in one kind of behavior does not mean that they have agreed to engage in another. Hello? It's you again. Gosh, this is the third time today. No, I don't care if this is my once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get the Sucker 3000 vacuum cleaner. Please, just stop harassing me. Sexual harassment is a type of bullying <laughs> intended to hurt or intimidate someone. It can include making sexual jokes, comments, or gestures to or about Ooh. someone. Spreading sexual oh, rumors oh. in person, oh. by text, or online writing sexual messages about people on bathroom stalls or in other public places, showing someone inappropriate sexual pictures or videos, touching, grabbing, or pinching someone in a deliberately sexual way, asking someone to send you naked pictures of herself or himself, pulling at someone's clothing, and brushing up against someone in a purposefully sexual way. If you're being harassed, don't blame yourself. The idea that someone was asking for it because of something they did, said, or were wearing is false and unacceptable. It often can be helpful to start mm -hmm. by telling the person doing the harassing to stop. Let him or her know that this behavior is not okay with you. If that doesn't stop the harassment, don't just ignore the behavior. Usually, ignoring it won't make it stop. Instead, tell a trusted adult about it. Telling go. someone mm -hmm. sooner leads to faster results. Sexual assault is when someone does something sexual to another person without getting their permission first. That can include anything from touching someone's genitals, breast, or butt, inserting something into any of their body parts, or showing them something sexual when they haven't given their explicit consent. If he assaults you in any way, first remember that it's not your fault. No matter who you were with, how you were dressed, or what you were doing, you have nothing to feel guilty about, period. If anyone ever rapes you or hurts you in any way, get to a hospital fast. Tell them what happened and they can help you take the steps to prevent illness or pregnancy and get you to the additional support you'll need. Most importantly, you should tell someone you trust, like your mom or a school counselor. You can tell them face to face, over text, on the phone, or however you're most comfortable. Talking to us was a good start. Until next time. Don't forget to visit me at amaze.org or go to my YouTube channel to watch more. Bye. Great. So I'm hoping that was kind of geared towards younger folks, but with sexual violence, the messages transcend all ages and stages. And because we know that sexual assault happens across the lifespan, uh, teaching young people to be very confident in how they ask for help and how they set their boundaries is essential to preventing sexual violence across the lifespan. Do know that I'll include links to all the videos I used in the YouTube chat. 
or in the um, PowerPoint so that you can use them as training tools as you work in your community as well. Okay, moving back into our presentation. I wanted to do a quick um, poll that to just, cause we have already heard a little bit of different language that we're using um, to see what are you, what are you commonly, how are you commonly referring to people who have experienced sexual violence? Um, are you calling them victim, survivor, target, or some other term? I'd love to see kind of what the common community terms are that you're using. Thanks, you, you all are pros on participating. I see that everyone's picking their amount. I'm gonna give folks just a few more minutes, or not minutes, but a few more seconds to respond. All right, we're at about 50, get to 60%. Great, I'm gonna end the poll and we'll share. We see that we actually, have for this group, we have a, a almost even split between uh, cho using the term victim and using the term survivor. And a few other folks use other terms. And if you feel comfortable sharing that in the chat, I would love to hear what kind of terms are feeling like they resonate in your community. I wanted to pause here to share kind of the theory and backstory a little bit between three terms that are commonly used when talking about people that have experienced sexual violence. And that is victim, survivor, and target. Victim has some of the oldest roots uh, in our work to end violence against women and sexual violence. And it, is very uh, embroiled in the criminal justice system. For example, in the, the look at Guam's uh, first degree sexual violence uh, statute, penal code statute, it uses the term victim. And that really calls out the person who has been victimized by sexual assault. And that, that term resonates with a lot of criminal justice folks and um, is the statute and term De force in, you know, in our culture, in our in our systems for a lot of, of folks. However, it is problematic. Uh, there are some issues with the term victim because it does center all the blame on the person who was victimized, and it has a connotation that they that they are they're un, unable to get through or uh, move past the victimization. So advocates of, you know, several decades ago started using the term survivor for survivors of sexual violence. And the onus of this was more of an empowerment base, um, empowerment, voice and choice for survivors, saying that survivors of sexual violence have some autonomy, have ability to heal, have appeal, ability to move past what has happened to them. Um, and we now even as advocates have issues with the term survivor. What we really want survivors to feel, people that have experienced sexual violence to feel is that they're thrivers. They're folks that can move and grow beyond that experience and they can heal and move into a, a space of healing and choice. So survivor was an advocate's kind of response to the criminal justice system terms of victim. Further is the term target, and that comes up in a lot of our work around sexual harassment and forms of sexual violence that do not seem to either have a very specified victim or person, or um, the person who is targeted doesn't experience the sexual harassment or the sexual nature of the action as a, as a crime or as something that is harming them. 
Uh, an example I've seen in this is working with hospitals where maybe a nurse and a doctor are in a romantic relationship and proceed to flirt in the break room or inappropriately touch each other in the break room. And although they aren't feeling that that behavior is sexually abusive to themselves, for other coworkers that are in that shared space, it is it can be creating a hostile work environment, creating something that makes it difficult to do your job. Um, and those are situations when using the term target might be better, a better suit for the person that is experiencing what others are considering or experiencing as sexual harassment or sexual violence. Here, just pictures of you know, kind of a general, like a victim, very kind of downtrodden with people standing around looking at her uh, to a more survivor empowerment focus from Lady Gaga, the Me Too movement. And then Target is more of picking someone out of a crowd as the person to focus the abuse on, but they, you're not really, you don't really know exactly how it's landing for that person. The prevalence of sexual violence, as I mentioned, uh, is very high. And I like this infographic because it's really simple. It's a great teaching tool for communities and interaction. It's a great teaching tool for families and friends just so they understand kind of how common this phenomenon of sexual violence is. Another note is I'm gonna use the term survivor a lot. Um, because I come from advocacy background, and that's just kind of how I see survivor or thriver is how I see and hold survivors um, space and advocacy space. So we see from national studies of the United States and territories that more than one in three women experience sexual violence involving a physical contact during their lifetime. When you take out the caveat of physical violence, you'll see that that increases even more to up to 80 to 90% of women experience some form of sexual violence that may not be physical in nature, harassment-based, discrimination-based um, in their lifetime. We also see that men experience sexual violence too. And so do people, no matter how they gender identify, experience sexual violence. This is not just a woman's issue. Um, there are roots in oppression and in gender roles, but both men, women, trans, however people identify, they can experience sexual violence. One in four to one in six men experience sexual violence involving a physical contact during their lifetime. As an aside, there are some wonderful resources for men specifically, such as one in six.org, that is specifically for men who are dealing with their experience of child sexual abuse. Finally, because this is an educational tool and a, and a web conference that can hopefully transcend just not folks that are doing victim services, but also the general community, it's important to sometimes put a price tag on this work. The estimated lifetime cost of rape is over $100,000 per victim. So that's per victim. So when we see our victimization rates of, you know, 5,000 to 10,000 a year in a county, we can times that by $100,000 to see what that kind of lifetime cost is on our society. So rape is not inexpensive. And it does not have uh, just a one-time impact. It has a lifetime ripple effect. I also wanted to share this, some recent trends in self-reported incidents of rape and sexual assault. You can see that you know, in 2014, 15 and 16, even 17, we were experiencing a, a lower rate of self-reported sexual uh, violence, rape or sexual assault. Again, realize these are not the criminal justice statistics. These are based on what people are self-reporting to the National Crime Victimization Survey. And then we see in 2018, we see a spike. And this is also in accordance with the Me Too, Me Too movement 
and a higher visibility of sexual violence, as well as a larger national and international dialogue about sexual violence. We see an increase in folks recognizing what has happened to them as rape, sexual assault, and finding the voice to self-report it. Some of the key findings from this, this study was that, you know, 37% of the victimizations reported on this national crime victimization survey were rape or sexual assault. So nearly 40% of all of the crimes reported were rape or sexual assault. That is a high amount when you consider that it also includes abuse, physical abuse, it includes maybe firearm involvement, um, and it is a large chunk of the violence that people are experiencing in our communities. Also, it's estimated that, you know, based on the data of the survey, that over 700,000 people were raped in the United States in 2018. So we times that times our $100,000 in lifetime cost. And we see that we have a million dollar problem, close to billion dollar problem as it accumulates over the years. This is a, a has a way of impact on our mental health and emotional health, our physical health, and also our financial health and our ability to engage in a successful society. So sexual assault's impact is much, it goes further than just a one-time calculation. Also, sexual assault is not just rape. Um, sexual assault is really on a continuum of harm. I love this graphic because it shows us in a visual way how sexual harassment kind of gradiates into what is formally recognized as sexual assault in our criminal codes. Sexual harassment can be crude jokes, sexual comments, vulgar, vulgar pictures. It sometimes can be difficult to pinpoint. Someone looked at you in a way that just made you feel uncomfortable. Someone said something to you and it took you a minute to really recognize that felt degrading or sexual in nature. And then as we continue through the continuum of harm, we see that seductive behavior, cat calling, inappropriate advances is the next level of a continuum of harm that is more targeted towards someone specifically. Crude jokes, sexual comments, and vulgar pictures may be more general in the community. And then we see as we continue down the continuum of harm that it gets more specific to individuals. Then we have touching, pinching, groping, then we, and then threats, blackmail, sexual bribes, um, sexual quid pro quo. If you do this for me, I will get you that promotion. I will make sure you have sick time. However it's tied, we've seen a lot of cases of that around employment and sexual harassment to sexual assault. And then finally, we have a level of sexual assault that is generally recognized across criminal justice jurisdictions, you know, physical force, sexual fonding, forcible assault, rape, and um, those are physical uh, crimes against a person but the continuum of harm is much broader than that. And also we're gonna be moving into a discussion of uh, rape culture and the continuum of harm really helps us understand why rape culture is so pervasive and continuing, even though we have all these laws on the books to outlaw physical sexual violence. This is a, a great video. Again, no videos are perfect. So I have my critiques and my analysis of all of these, but I do feel like this video about the devil's advocate and looking at sexual assault and rape culture is a great way to start to unpack some of the myths and the prevalent cultural norms that allow, allow rape to be kind of expected in our society, allow sexual violence to be ignored. So without further ado, I'll bring up this video.
Just having one minute. <laughs> Hold on one second. Here we go, finally. Sorry, everyone, here we go. I'm here to interview someone named Jeremy for a short film that I'm doing about the existence of rape culture. Ah, yes. I'm Jeremy. You're in the right place. We're just waiting on one more. Ah, uh, sorry I'm late. Traffic was hell. <laughs> this is the devil. I'm his advocate. And regarding the controversial subject of rape culture, we just have a few questions. Uh... Oh, I get it. Okay, so... You're the devil's advocate and you're here to question the existence of rape culture. Go on. Well, first of all, the devil would like to make it very clear that he is anti-rape. Even the devil knows that rape is bad. Okay. But the term rape culture just feels like a trendy phrase to mean that all men are super pro-rape. Rape culture is a term designed to show the ways that sexual violence is normalized and trivialized in our society. This can be anything from the jokes we tell to the movies we watch to certain choice t-shirts sold in Times Square to even some laws. But what do you mean rape is normalized? It's not normal, it doesn't happen a lot, and when it does, we label rapists as monsters. First of all, it does happen a lot. Um, on average, an American is sexually assaulted every 98 seconds. Whoa, I did not know that. <laughs> and second of all, rape and sexual assault are not just committed by monsters. For years, we did think that. We thought that rape and sex crimes were only committed by men literally driven insane by sex. They were put in mental institutions instead of prisons. But now we know that's not true. It's not just insane men who commit sex crimes. It's all sorts of people. It's friends, it's coworkers, it's otherwise upstanding citizens. Like everyone you can think of. And also we now know that sex crimes aren't just motivated by sex. They're also motivated by power. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, good point. Also, are you hungry? No, it's not okay, thank you. I can't eat one. But what do you mean rape culture? Our culture labels rape as bad. I don't see a lot of people going around saying, yay, rape. No, but I mean, there are so many examples of ways that rape and sexual assault are normalized and trivialized in our society. Like, off the top of my head, uh, songs like Blurred Lines that say a woman wants it even though she says she doesn't. Trite jokes in stand-up clubs about how funny it is to put a roofie in a woman's drink. Uh, the fact that we elected a president who bragged about grabbing women's genitals without their consent. And police who ask rape victims what they were wearing when they were raped. But what about the times there are false accusations? Rape culture might encourage a witch hunt. Right, D? Mm-hmm. So false accusations do happen, but really rarely. So despite the recent support for victims of sexual violence to come forward, it still sucks to do so. I mean, accusers are often stigmatized more than the people they're accusing. People try to discredit them. They say they're lying to get attention or to get money. And they have to relive their trauma by telling their story over and over and over again. It's the reason a lot of people have chosen to remain anonymous when coming forward with the recent wave of sexual harassment allegations. But if you blame a culture for rape, then you implicate all men. Doesn't that take away the blame from actual rapists? No. No, it doesn't. Rape culture can exist, and people can also be held responsible for their actions. Jeremy, look at me. Don't just look at me. The devil would have you believe that things are black and white. That if one side is right, other side must be wrong. But that's not true. I have something to say. Hey, devil, you don't have to talk. That's what you pay me for. 
The thing that bothers me is that I never hear about empathy towards men who survive sexual assault. I mean, people make prison rape jokes all the time, and we laugh at movies where a much older woman takes a lucky teenager's virginity. I mean, it's just assumed that men want it all the time without exception. And if a man is assaulted by someone, then he's seen as a wimp. This is weird to say, but devil, you make a great point. Rape culture affects people of all genders. And everyone, no matter the gender, should be held responsible for their actions regarding sexual violence. la di da guess you have all the answers. No, I do not. This is a really, really complicated issue, especially when you take into account things like patriarchy and power and privilege and how all those systems work together. No one has all the answers. Wow, I really learned a lot today. So did I. I mean, I learned that the devil's real, which I'm just, I'm just now taking in. <laughs> All right, I hope that kind of started to define rape culture for you and started to get you thinking about how rape culture shows up in our society. Let me get back to the PowerPoint. I really like this graphic too. It's a great kind of flat way if you don't have multimedia to talk about rape culture and how what we actually can map as the continuum of violence builds on itself. So the explicit violence is just at the tip top of rape culture. What is supporting it is widespread victimization and the normalization of that as like locker room talk, tropes like boys will be boys, rape jokes, sexist attitudes, victim blaming, unwanted touching. And then it goes up to a, a little less um, widespread of degree, degradation. And it includes sending dick pics or threats and stalking, up the skirt photos, revenge porn, especially with our electronic access right now. There is you know, a lot of places where people can make bad decisions and degrading decisions around the use of photos and electro electronics and electronic communications. Then you start moving into the assault um, bracket where it's a little bit less again, and it's a removal of autonomy. So these are places where there's coercion, safe word violations, inadvertent condom remo removal, all different ways that people that are perpetrating sexual violence are taking away the autonomy or self-choice of people that are their targets, survivors, or victims. And then only at the top is the explicit violence. And that's the actual rape, incest, battery, murder that we see litigated in our and prosecuted in our, in our court systems. And that's all to say that, you know, the, the lower levels are where all of this starts and where it needs to be interrupted in order to prevent and end the explicit violence at the top of the pyramid. I have yet another video. I know that's like video hour, but we'll um, take a break after this video and regroup. But this is um, a rape culture video that just kind of asks us to turn the issue of sexual violence on its head and look at it in a different way. So let's take a, let me share this with y'all. Okay. <laughs> Team versus team. That's as good as it gets. Oh, man. I've never had more fun my whole life. <laughs> Daddy's out of beer. I'm going to go to another one. Dude. Hey. Is your card? No. Lamorne, stop doing magic. You're not good at it. Guys? Oh, dude. There's a bear in your other room here. What? Oh, that's just the big, angry, hungry bear. Just pretend it's not there. Oh, really? Yeah. And it'll just go away? What are you talking about? No, I don't think it's going anywhere, but I don't know what to do about it, so I just ignore it. So it's not, it's like, it's not dangerous, right? Define dangerous. It's a bear. <laughs>
But, you know, it's not getting oh. all of us. It only it's like one in five. So. Sorry. Hold on. I said only one in five. So we're fine. That's a lot, man. That means one of us. Wait one sec. Statistically. That doesn't mean one of us. It means one in five people. I think I may have lost the video for you all. Let me get back to it. I said only one in five, so we're fine. That's a lot, man. That means one of us is gonna be eaten. Statistically. And that doesn't mean one of us. It means one in five people getting eaten. Oh, 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 you're doing something about this, man. Hey, what do you want me to do about it? You guys know the old saying, bears will be bears. That's not a saying. But more, a bear will be a bear, <laughs> so. You can't just blame the bear, not when it's attacking 20% of the people who come here. <laughs> 20%? I said one in five. Yes, that's 20%. And no, it isn't. It's one in five, you math nerd. Let's pile on this guy. Dude, you gotta get rid of this thing. Or at least warn us that there is a bear in the other room, man. We gotta look out for each other. What are you doing? Hey, what happens between you guys and the bear is none of my business. Wait, how is this none of your business, man? One in five people are gonna get attacked by this bear! Ah! The bear is not going to eat all of us. It, it'll be less than a quarter of us. None of us should die. And it affects us all, Jake. One in five. How can you ignore something so important? How can I protect your friend? One in five. One in five. All right, so I know that we are, we're a long webinar today. So I wanted to invite you to take a break and then we're gonna get back together in about 10 minutes. So take a stretch break, come back and we're gonna do some breakout rooms to kind of talk about these rape culture videos and what rose to the surface. So come on back at three, at four, oh, I'm not gonna do the time right. Do it in about 10 minutes, okay? And I'll see you then.
Thanks, Shelby. It'll be about 10.08 when we return. Thanks for the time translation for me. No problem. All right, take a final stretch. We'll come back together in a couple minutes here. Grab some water for the last bit of the last half of the webinar.
Great. I see a message from Taylor that CEUs are available and you have to attend all the sessions, but it's a great way to get your 1.5 CEUs. I'm always trying to do that for, for my professional degree all through it. So it's wonderful for you all to be able to get those through these sessions. I'm gonna let everyone come back, welcome back. Hope that you were able to think a little bit more about these videos. And now I'd really like you to go into a breakout room and answer these two questions as a group. You know, what did you like best about these videos? and or what didn't work about the videos, if there's anything that bugged you about them. And then what do these videos show you about rape culture? Did they show you anything? Did you learn anything new from these videos? So I think Shelby is setting up our breakout rooms now and you'll have five minutes to kind of process these videos and then we'll come back together and I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. See you in five minutes.
sun is setting in my background, so I must apologize. I think, are we about ready to bring them back, Shelby? Yeah, I think rooms are closing. Oh, they're closed okay. now. Yay! <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. I would love to hear kind of what you thought about the videos. Were they helpful? And did you learn anything new about rape culture? Did they inspire you in any way? So if anyone wants to share or chat uh, kind of what their reactions to these videos were and whether they, um, they taught you anything different or more about rape culture. Um, and I'll just add, um, if you don't know where to find the raise hand feature um, in the bottom of the Zoom window where it says participants, um, you should be able to click there and then you'll see the raise hand feature um, and you can raise your hand and I'll be able to unmute folks. But I think folks can also unmute themselves. I did have uh, just a thought to add on here uh, is that a lot of some of the videos are skewed towards kind of telling people how not to be victims of sexual violence and sexual har harassment. Whereas a really important part of, of, undermine, of changing rape culture is disrupting the entitlement that some people feel towards abusing or hurting other people. And so it's really important that when we think of dismantling rape culture, we think not just at what victims need to do or potential victims or people that could be targets of abuse need to do. But we think about what folks that could cause harm need to do um, to change the way they interact with other people, to read cues, to build empathy, to seek and understand the concept of consent. All right. Just feel free if you have any thoughts or um, pieces that you wanna add as we move forward to add to the chat and we'll keep moving forward. And Shelby, be sure to in, just you know, interrupt me if there's something pops up. So one of the preventionist themes, I love prevention, I love the idea of shifting social norms is to focus on what the facts are here uh, and to dismiss and dispel some of the myths that can really uh, be harmful to society. So I wanted to share just six facts about sexual violence. The first one I've said a few times and I'll repeat it here is that anyone can experience sexual violence. You do not have to be a woman. You do not have to have a vagina no matter their profession, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, race, class, or ability, you can experience sexual violence. And there is not any one of these categories or groups that is free of, with, of sexual violence at this point. So sexual violence is experienced across this whole spectrum of identities. The next piece is that consent is freely given. It's a clearly stated yes. It is not infer inferred. Silence is not consent. Being drunk or drugged or unable to understand or speak is not consent. Being passed out or unconscious is not consent to sexual activity. Next piece is that previous sexual conduct, including previous consent with the same person does not guarantee consent for sex right now. If someone kissed you yesterday, that doesn't mean they want to kiss you today. Consent always, always needs to be freely given and must be ongoing. Next one is that, you know, rape is never the victim's fault. Wearing what you wear, how you 
dance, whether you stayed late at a party, whether you walked a street at night is never an excuse for sexual assault. It's a crime of violence and control that stems from the person that's causing harm, determination to exercise power over another person. Clothing, behavior are not invitations to sexual activity. Forcing someone to engage in non-consensual sex activity is rape, regardless of what that person's wearing, dresses or acts, whether that person is involved in sex work or not, whether you've had sex with that person before. It's never, there's never an excuse um, or invitation for, for rape. One of the things in California, only in the 1970s did we finally establish that you could be raped within a marriage relationship. There used to be spousal rape or as a separate crime, it wasn't just rape. So that's a social norms change that we had to affect in my own state. And many other states have had to examine how they look at sexual violence within uh, marriage relationships too. make sure that they're treating it as sexual violence and sexual assault. The other, another fact is a person under the influence of drugs or alcohol can't consent to sexual activity. And if you don't have consent, then it's sexual assault. So this is a really important piece to talk to young people and to people that are starting to experiment with drugs and alcohol. They need to understand that consent is not, uh, you can't be given under the influence of drugs and alcohol. Figuring out what that influence is may be different in different jurisdictions, but it's really important for people to consider, is that person able to give consent? Are they sober to give consent? And then finally, um, most rapes are committed by someone the victim knows. So stranger danger and being raped in a dark alley is not the norm. 80% of offenders are known to the victim and you know, they can be in any type of relationship with the survivor or victim, including marriage, dating relationships, classmates, acquaintances, coworkers. In the case of child sexual abuse, we see it's often trusted members either within the immediate family, extended family or community um, that gain the ch children's trust in grooming behaviors. So we know that 80% of people that perpetrate this harm are known to the persons they're harming. Now I wanna just be able to show you a, yet another video about consent. Even if you've seen this one before, I think it's a worthwhile to just take a moment to look at this and how it also starts to unpack the rape culture we live in and how it actually pivots to informing, teaching, and changing the social norms around sexual activity and consent. So one second. If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my God, I would love a cup of tea. Thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, then you could make them a cup of tea or not, but be aware they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important part, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you are entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say no thank you, then don't make them tea at all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes, please. That's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time that it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind. And you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea. And they can't answer the question, do you want tea? Because they're unconscious. 
Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea. And they said yes. But in the time it took you to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down. Make sure the unconscious person is safe. And this is the important part again. Don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they're safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it going, but you wanted tea last week. Or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat going, but you wanted tea last night. But if you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you're able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand it when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to go make myself a cup of tea. If you're with consent, just imagine. All right. Show of hands if you can find your hands um, to see where, if you've seen this before. If you can find your blue hand to, to raise your, your hand in Zoom. Oh, I'm not seeing many, so I'm hoping maybe this is a new uh, tool for you. Okay, I see a few thumbs up. Great, great. This is a great way to just start the conversation around expected behavior and consent. Another thing I really like um, to use is analogy of like running through a field with someone. So when you're running through a field with someone and you're holding their hand, you're constantly checking in on that person to see like, are you with me? Am I running too fast? Am I going too slow? Like you're checking in. Consent is an organic, fun, clear thing. If you're not um, in a joyful uh, partnership running through that field of daisies or whatnot, you got to take a step back because that means both partners are not fully engaged and fully consenting in that moment. So kind of remembering these ways where we just bring the humanity back to sexual activity. So we're really understanding what consent is and recognizing how people signal whether they're giving consent or not. If you're unsure, if it's not a clear yes, you need to ask. And what I tell young people all the time is if you don't feel comfortable enough to ask to have the sexual activity, you shouldn't be having the sexual activity. You've got to be able to figure out the words and how to express consent. Um, that is part of engaging in sexual intimacy. So hopefully those will be tools to help you in talking about consent and trying to shift some of those rape cultural norms where some groups feel empowered to take sexual activity and sexual gratification and abuse others. Okay, let's go back to our presentation. I like this infogra infographic too. I just wanted to be able to leave you with several ways of talking about and expressing consent, starting those conversations because it actually is not that hard of a topic, but I, every time I give a presentation, consent continues to be like this gray area when really it doesn't have to be. So moving in to kind of what you can do as someone that is going to be in contact with survivors. The fact of the matter is, is you're already in contact with survivors of sexual assault. They may be in your family, in your workplace, in your apartment building, because the prevalence is so high, you know someone with sexual assault, even if you don't know they have been assaulted. So there may become a time when a survivor comes to you for help and support. And I really want to leave you with a few simple ways to do the best to support survivors and not to do harm. 
So I've created a framework of the three L's. The first one is really about learning, uh, being open to learning about sexual violence, prevalence and its impacts, not ignoring the issue, being curious. Then there's listen. And that in simple, in, in more common terms is listening to the survivor without judgment. And maybe, you know, making sure that you're in a space to be able to listen. Not all situations are, and contexts are going to allow you to be the active listener that a survivor deserves. And then finally is the link to this linking the survivor to community resources. It sounds like in Guam, you have a very strong coalition from the attendees I see here. You have great community support and uh, interest in connecting and supporting survivors with resources. So there's local and national and international resources I wanna share with you as well. So the first piece is you know really being open to learning. Uh, that means seeking out information from your local communities and their expertise around sexual violence, as well as, you know, your coalition has been wonderful in seeking out national and international experts, bringing Cal Costa in, attending the national conferences to get the most up-to-date information about sexual violence. Then it's important to try and read information and fact sheets just so you have a baseline knowledge. Because no matter what your day-to-day -day job is, you're going to have contact with people that have experienced sexual violence. So kind of understanding that and the underpinnings of rape culture are very, very important. And the, and the, the second place is build those relationships so you have people and places where you can ask questions and build your knowledge. I wanted to share with you kind of one uh, intersection around sexual violence. And one of these things I'm, I'm really encouraging you to bring to your communities is that sexual violence intersects with a lot of different issues in our community. So we, this is a really great fact sheet about the link between housing and sexual violence. In California and other places in the nation, we are experiencing a huge spike in homelessness and in folks that don't have permanent housing. And so advocates are looking at this intersection and what that means for survivors of sexual violence. So the first thing to kind of on this sheet is to understand that 52% of sexual assaults occur where the victims live. And that really leads to 71% of victims wanting to move after being sexually assaulted because they, you know, they couldn't, they can't get away from the place where they were sexually assaulted. Another piece here is, you know, understanding why young people leave their homes. 61% of girls report being sexually abused at home and that being connected to their homelessness. So when you look, when you're open to learning, you're open to connecting the issue of sexual violence to other issues you may be passionate about or for which your community is seeking um, resources or uh, seeking solutions. So with this kind of power of learning and opening ourselves up to the intersectionality of sexual violence with different issues, you can sit at those tables with your criminal justice hat on, with your teacher hat on, with your parent hat on, and bring the issues that matter to your family and community with you from a lens of a connection to sexual violence. The link between housing and sexual violence is just one of many examples of this, but I feel like in your, when you're, in your circles of power and influence, when you can bring the issue of sexual violence and well, how do you think survivors of sexual violence would feel about this policy or these changes? It can make a huge difference in how our community functions and how survivors see, seem and feel heard in community. The next part is listening to survivors. And it sounds like from some of the stories I've heard today and from some of the descriptions of your work, a lot of you already are advocates working with survivors or have directly work it, worked with survivors before. But for us that maybe, some of us that maybe haven't or haven't in a while, I wanted to go through the tenets of active listening. 
listening to survivor means to really take a step back and create a space where you can hear what a survivor is telling you without planning a comeback, without thinking about what, what this means to you, but actually listening to what the survivor says. So these are just some basic tenets to keep in mind is listen without planning out what your response is. Uh, be present. That's going to require maybe sitting in a, on the ground or walking in a place where you feel comfortable, being able to make eye contact. Be ready not to interrupt. Check yourself. Uh, don't interrupt with content. Maybe only ask follow-up questions or something that is just supportive, like head nodding. Don't add your own experiences or make it about you. Here's some things that are really important to say to survivors. It is not your fault. In our society, sexual violence is incredibly shamed and survivors immediately think that they did something to deserve this. Many, many survivors don't even report because they can't even realize that they were sexually assaulted. They felt like they caused the assault. Also say and ask, what do you need? What do you want to do? instead of telling them what to do. So this, this active listening stance is a really important skill. And I'm gonna show you another video about active listening, not only in the context of sexual violence, but all these skills really need to be front of mind when someone that is a survivor wants to talk to you about what happened to them, or if you're talking to people in the community and you're actively getting disclosures of abuse. So let's, let's look at this video together and um, see what you think. Hi, um, Emily, I just want to jump in too. Um, we had a question uh, in the chat that came up around um, going back to what we were talking about, about rape culture. Um, and so they asked, do you think the dialogue of rape culture has shown progression and prevention? Yeah, I think that this... I th even the videos themselves, the fact that there are so many videos, you can see that people in high pro profile positions are talking about issues of, you know, rape culture as being systemic, as it being something that is very hard to point out as it being part of this unwanted fabric of our culture. And I think that, th that our, approach in disabling rape culture has to really take on the norms and the socialization that lets some folks feel entitled to sexual power over people or power over people and how it connects with oppression. And I really like, you know, the devil's advocate video because at the end, the speaker really shares like, this is complex. I don't have all the answers. But I think prevention and our advocacy is in a position now to struggle with the complexity and to not shy away from those conversations. I also you know, think as a preventionist and as someone that really looks at public health models that even these initial conversations have, can have ripple impacts in our social norms. If we are teaching young kids about consent and boundaries from a young age. We're teaching both people that may be victimized as well as people that may cause harm. And so we're hopefully shifting what, how they grow into their sexuality and how they see consent and how they share and see power dynamics. So I hope that kind of answers the question and I'd love to talk about it more, but I've really seen in the past about 10 years an openness to these difficult conversations that are going to lead to bigger and greater social norms change. All right. And here's one more video. <laughs> so let's talk about listening. It's easy. We all think we're good listeners, but have you ever done this? Or this? Or this? Oh dear, I have. Well, sadly we all have. 
Oh, well, if everyone does it, then it can't be that big a deal. Actually, it is. When we don't listen, we're saying, yeah, what you're saying isn't important. Oh, dear. So, what should I do? Well, be present and focus when your friend is talking. We call this active listening. Ugh, that sounds hard. Well, the more you do it, the better you become. A great way to practice active listening is to stop. Like at a stop street? Not that kind of stop. It stands for stop, breathe, listen, respond. So first you stop what you're doing. And yes, you guessed it. Then you breathe. Now you're ready to listen and... What if I... Without do... interrupting. And we don't just listen with our ears. We listen with our whole body. My body talks? You betcha. Look at Jim over here. What do you think his body is communicating to his friend? He's bored for sure. So how can I not be like Jim? Well, make sure your eyes are looking straight at the person talking. Your feet are still on the floor. Your mouth is quiet. No talking or making weird sounds. What's next? Now you're ready to respond in a kind and patient way. Find out more about the situation, but don't try to solve everything. But if I can't solve the problem, what can I say? So say something to encourage them, like, tell me more, or how did that make you feel? Or even, what can I do to help? So to be an active listener, I need to stop, breathe, listen, and only then respond? A plus. Crushed it! So again, this is just a great tool for many of you that are advocates. This is preaching to the choir, but if you haven't been an advocate or work directly with survivors, this stop, breathe, listen, then respond is critical to keeping that choice and voice within the survivor and not taking it away through interruptions, clarifications, and judgment. And it can be really hard um, to do because this, uh, this detail, this type of uh, taking time to listen is not uh, what has been prioritized in our society right now. So part of the social norms change we need to create in taking down rape culture is building community empathy and listening skills as well. All right, again, I'll save all these resources for you and make sure that they're included so you can use them as teaching and learning tools in your community. I wanted to kind of start to conclude and then move into questions uh, with links to your local sexual violence resources. I know that you all already know these resources. I would just like to put an, you know, a a star or point towards our local sexual assault agencies. And for you, that's Healing Hearts Crisis Center as a place that has community experience and knowledge about working on issues of sexual assault in the community. And they will have the best understanding of the laws and jurisdiction and intersections that are facing survivors in the community. Also your coalition is the territory-wide organizing um, force. And they both work locally, but then they also are engaging on international, national and international conversations about sexual assault prevention and response. So they're a great resource for what's happening that's new, uh, new studies, new information, new theories, and new strategies for disrupting sexual violence and uh, ending sexual violence. And then this slide is really to point to some of the national resources that you have at your fingertips. And RAIN and the national hotline is available for you know, everyone that can get access to phone line and or uh, internet. They also have a text chat option. Another piece is that contacting law enforcement is an option. In California, we have protections about confidentiality, 
that does not exist in Guam in the same way. Uh, but uh, an empowerment theory around responding to sexual violence means that we support how a survivor wants to engage with all the systems. So as advocates and as someone that's supporting survivors, we really want to support their choices and their voice and not put paths in their way, force them down certain paths or um, create more trauma through those paths. What we've noticed in intersections with criminal justice and prosecution, survivors have to tell their story often many, many times. We're creating more trauma-informed approaches where survivors maybe only have to tell their story a few times and that reduces their level of trauma. But it's a, it's, there's still a tension there. There's still a difficulty with retelling the story. It's also important to realize that trauma impacts survivors. So the telling of their story, the retelling of events is impacted by the crisis they've undergone. It's very hard for survivors to put together a linear path of what happened to them. They may only have sights or sounds or flashbacks of what happened to them because their body was in a crisis, in crisis and was just trying to survive the moment. Making sure law enforcement and all people that work with survivors understand that. And it's not being flighty or being unreliable. It's actually the impact of trauma. That's another reason listening is really important because active listening is allows the story to come out organically instead of trying to prize the story to fit into a certain scheme. It allows the survivor to talk through their story. Really important for how the survivor figures out what paths of healing are right for them. Another piece is, you know, the forensic exam is a gathering of physical evidence. And as advocates and as someone that may come in contact with survivors, it's an option for survivors to engage with. And there is some disappearance of evidence over time. So just having that knowledge is another piece where you can bring some of that knowledge and um, learning in is understanding that some forensic evidence will degrade over time. And so it's important for survivors to know that when they're making a choice of whether or not to get a forensic exam. And then I wanted to just also share, you know, two resources. The National Sexual Violence Resource Center is, is really that for the United States and has a database of information. If you had an issue you wanted to do further research on, you'll be able to find a lot of that information and their curators slash librarians are very accessible. So I would- How are you? Urge... Good morning, good morning, how are you? <laughs> I would urge you to be sure to- nice day though. Yeah, today. If you have an area that you want to do yeah. further research on. And then finally, uh, Reliance is another national uh, figurehead with education and support. Uh, that has some really great tools for talking about sexual assault. They started as a, as a group that was looking at sport and sexual assault and are made of several really strong um, partners, including CalCASA, the uh, Pennsylvania Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and uh, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center as a national voice around sexual assault policy and advocacy. So um, I wanted to ask everyone to share in the chat because spoiler alert, I'm going to be presenting a few more of these web conferences in this series for you. Are there other issues or er areas that you wish you knew about? What did you, st what do you still wish you knew about supporting survivors of sexual violence? I wanted to also um, mention that anything here that goes against cultural norms or expectations for your community, 
I want you to center that. Um, if shaking hands is not appropriate, if physical touch is not appropriate for in your community, direct eye contact is not appropriate for your community, I really respect and center your expertise as community members and as advocates in the community and make sure that this is just general information that can be tailored to your community needs and your community, the uh, way your community interacts with each other. Okay, supporting individuals with disabilities. That is a much needed um, area. I know the National Sexual Violence Resource Center has several fact sheets and studies on the dif disparate impacts on persons with disabilities. Right, support to individuals with disabilities, especially those that are nonverbal. And that is an intersection with healthcare that there are some tools, but working specifically with nonverbal skills can be more difficult. Uh, there's a vocab piece there where you have to try and figure out ways to show what abuse is, figure out consent, and also figure out how people could report what happened to them. Um, I know working with nonverbal children, there's the use of puppets, there's the use of different tools where people can point and try to explain what happened to them if you're talking about disclosures um, for persons with disabilities or, or nonverbal and may not have American Sign Language or have a sign language language. Any other, Shelby, did you see any other pieces I'm missing? Uh, no, I'm glad you addressed the cultural um, sort of how it might be um, for Guam's culture specifically, um, because yes, that was brought to my attention as well, um, that it might be when you're, when you're interacting with survivors, there might be some things that are different um, there in Guam than it is here in California. So. Um, but besides that, I haven't seen any other questions or responses in the chat. And I did get a question about helping survivors heal. And I've done um, some research on this. And one of my favorite books is called The Body Keeps the Score. And that urges us as advocates and support persons and community to think beyond traditional talk therapy to ways people can engage with their body and work through their experience of trauma. In fact, it might be something you wanna look into more of how to integrate the trauma that happened to you. Because what we see when people ignore or silo or um, bury the trauma that happens, it often comes back um, in different ways. It also often requires coping mechanisms that can cause harm, like the use of substances or, uh, addiction to shopping or, you know, there's various ways of figuring out addiction and trying to make us feel better or make us forget. But with, a, with the idea of integration of trauma, it's helping people understand what happened to them and how it created the person they are now. Uh, so it's more of an integration approach than just talking about the subject. There's also a lot of good new science around therapies that are about motion. They're about eye movement. Uh, they're not about just talking through what happened to you and the typical like therapist chair. There's ways to heal and humans are incredibly resilient. So tapping into that is um, kind of the new wave in helping survivors heal. Yeah, and I, um, I looked at the chat, scrolled back up, and there was one other um, question in the chat about around um, faith. So it says, how can rape culture be prevented when the trust in faith is supposed to be a place of worship, um, where people who are usually vulnerable, broken, um, and seeking Christ, yet abuse somewhat exists there? Um, and so do you see these, this as a trend as well? 
I mean, unfortunately, I see it in a trend across systems. It's not just the church. I see it also in areas like child protective services where you where people are dependent on protecting vulnerable people, but they also are sites of abuse. So part of this is, is trying to engage with church communities and build and support leadership within those communities to create conversation. In, in a lot of ways, the healing begins with conversations that are open and come from a beloved community stance. That's really an organizing principle of building community accountability without ostracizing or shutting down a system, not letting go of the very important healing and therapeutic pieces of religion, but recognizing that some pieces of religion are causing harm. And that some of the ways the system and the power and control dynamics have worked in these systems, including churches, including schools, including criminal justice, including in the military. They've created power structures where sexual abuse is allowed to be ignored or protected. And so what we need to do is build those internal and external champions that are gonna start talking about the issue. It may be a pastor or a priest or a community leader or elder that can start to have the conversations and start to build a dialogue. What you'll notice is when people start to feel comfortable naming the sexism, abuse, harassment they're experiencing in these systems, that's when you have a meaningful opportunity to create change. And I just strongly agree in Calcasa, you know, since I worked with Calcasa for so long, um, I know that we are not about shutting systems down and shutting down people's opportunities to find healing and community. We are about bringing as many um, folks to the table and, and voices to the table to stop, start peeling back the shame and secrecy around sexual violence, which is, it is very specific to sexual violence. Folks don't want to talk about it because it, it goes against our Puritan and religious roots in a lot of ways. It goes against uh, our private and public spheres. We have put sexual activity in a very private place. And it's just really critical to start to think about how your community can start having those conversations. One example is I've held um, days of dialogue within religious groups where we've sat in small group tables with a facilitator's guide and talked about child sexual abuse. And we talked about what it was, what it looked like, and what we as community experts thought we could do to interrupt it because nobody at that table thought it was an okay thing. Um, we all were already on board to create change. Oh, I see something from Lourdes. Um, okay, so if there are policies that are made to prevent sexual violence, not just respond. So that actually is my thing I am super passionate about. I do believe there are policies for that. I think that some of the policies are both prevention, education, communication, and dialogue. Um, and then there's also the valuable prevention impact of when survivors are listened to and centered. So when folks see that survivors are credited, listened to, centered, supported, and supported in finding ways to heal, you're going to shift the stigma away from the victim survivor to community solutions. I think that one of the really interesting areas of policy change is around sex ed education for young people, around school policies on how they engage in restorative approaches versus punitive approaches. Um, and then also, you know, looking beyond just punitary responses for the issue of sexual violence. Another issue we don't like to talk about as a field very much is what to do with people that cause harm. So what do we do? How do we engage with, how do we rehabilitate 
Can we rehabilitate people that have caused harm? I think there is a lot of evidence that there can be changes for some people that cause harm. Um, and we don't put enough resources towards that as well. So that's a kind of preventing re-victimization or the continued victimization. But I think education outreach and then also voicing, providing survivors a place at the table in how they're treated and how they're talked about and how the issue is framed, as well as community expertise and young people. When you can build community with young people, that can be an incredible, liberating, changing um, environment that prevents sexual violence. Because if we all just stood up and said, okay, that joke's not funny anymore. Suddenly the person that said that joke gets that message, gets the community support around them that says, okay, this is not okay behavior and they start to change their behavior. Uh, one, a, a little bit about me is I am a mom of four, for a small, for young kids. And I think it has a lot to do with how we set up our expectations and how we interrupt things that are harmful. So it's kind of going back to childhood development really is like when you go to prevention, you're going to interrupting behavior and providing a different way of being, a different way of connecting with each other. I hope that helped a little bit, but it is a huge issue. And uh, if you go to preventconnect.org, you can get connected with some of these really groundbreaking conversations around prevention. Hey, Emily, I'm not sure if you answered this already, but um, someone asks, how can they help during lockdown? All right. Yeah, we, I have, um, I'm going to do a web conference on essential workers as well. But just in general, I think that acknowledging that communities are facing unprecedented stress right now is really important. I'm sorry, it turned into night over here and I have to turn on some lights or you're not going to be able to see me. Um, so some basic tips on supporting survivors during this pandemic is increased accessibility. Some people may not feel comfortable and if they're sick, they may not be able to access services in person. So figuring out ways, hotlines, using telehealth and technology to help connect to survivors is, is important. For prevention, trying to find consistent ways to stay connected to the people you're working with or educating or mobilizing is, is really important. We are, I'm currently part of a couple community organizing groups where we're meeting with small groups of young people, adult allies, and trying to do uh, community building projects and engaging in mutual aid as a way of connecting the issue of sexual violence to community safety and health. Right now, actually with the, with the pandemic and the social justice crisis that we've been having for a long time and is Guam is no stranger to these crises and tensions as well. Being able to just acknowledge that and recognize that sexual violence and violence, domestic violence are not separate from what our community is facing. It is an intersection with all these other issues. So creating better accessibility and being able to just recognize that people may not be able to deal with the power and control wheel right now. They may not be able to engage with education around myths and facts, but if there's a way you can build relationship and keep that the issue in front of them, you're going to be creating a relationship that grows and um, provides a, a framework for true prevention. I think one of the things that preventionists have realized um, is that our issue does not exist in a vacuum. It has to be connected with other overlaying systems of oppression. And 
our issue is connected to the Black Lives Matter movement. Our issue is connected to the disparity, disparity in health that poor folks face. So we need to kind of be open to learning about those, those pieces too. Great. Um, I have another kind of follow-up question on sex education. Uh, I have worked on policy around sex education in California schools, and I've worked in hybrid like workshops and education around both sex education and consent and healthy relationships. So I think that it is very important to center sex education even one step back in something called social emotional learning for young children. Social emotional learning is this huge, <laughs> it's huge area. It's kind of like, I kind of fall back on it. It's like just teaching people to be human to each other. Like how you interact with someone, how you feel empathy, um, how you provide support, how you set your boundaries. So when we work with everyone, um, if people are being grown, socialized and raised with social emotional learning, they're coming in with a lot of skills that help them in healthy relationships writ large. So that means healthy relationships with peers, uh, initially with their teachers, with their parents, with their siblings, then it moves into healthy relationships with whoever they're sexually, uh, interested in, wh whatever their sexual identity is, um, healthy relationships and, and mutual respect for gender expression and identity. And it moves into an understanding of consent because we talk about consent in a sexual act, but there are things we consent to all the time. And we need to teach young people, we need to teach our children and we need to model it as adults what is appropriate consent? What does it look like? And how do we support those choices? One thing you can do is make a, make a promise to yourself as with the young people in your lives to not touch their bodies if they don't consent to it. That means you don't just give them a an involuntary hug. You don't pat them on the head. You don't pinch their cheeks. You don't grab them or have them sit on your lap. You start to model what appropriate boundaries look like and you support them. And if you see someone touch them, you check in with that young person and say, is that okay with you? Do you, do you does that feel comfortable to you? And you start to have a conversation about boundaries and you start to let people workshop and figure out what their boundaries are. That's the empowerment model too, which makes it more complicated, more gray. There's no bright line on boundaries. People have to feel empowered to set their own, you know, and they're going to be different for each, for all people. And we, as the human race, have to learn how to read those cues and respect each other's boundaries, even when they're different from ours. To follow up on that a little bit more is I think one of the powerful things in prevention education and sex education is when the facilitator can be consistent, um, when the facilitator connects to young people. Sometimes that means they're younger. Sometimes it means they're more hip or engaged with youth culture. Um, being able to be consistent and a trusted adult and build trust without just taking is really, really important. Um, so setting up your education so it's not just a one-time deal, but where you're able to do what we call like a multi-dose um, type of curriculum or series of workshops has been shown to have more long-term impacts for young people, for people that are uh, participating in them. And I'd say there's also a role for adults in that. So there's a role for us engaging caregivers and parents 
in talking about boundaries and talking about how to model those boundaries and talking about how to have these conversations with the children in their lives and the next generation. Through my years, I've learned a lot of patience. So if you have something you wanna chat privately to Shelby or and I, we will try and handle it as anonymously as possible. And um, if you want just a few more minutes to think about um, questions, I would love to hang out with you here uh, to answer them. Oh, great. I got another um, follow-up question. So have I struggled with teaching social behaviors to people with different cultures, beliefs, especially when related to sex education? Yes, yes, yes. And um, so I think one of the things as a white woman um, sitting here, the first thing I would say is I am not the teacher. You have community teachers and leaders. And I would say one of the best strategies is to get a think tank, get a group of like-minded folks together in the culture and start to connect to this issue and how, how the healthy relationship pieces, consent pieces are connected to culture. Some of my most powerful work within religion has been when I can connect consent and this, the, the you know, not non-abusive, non-harassment based material to actual scripture, to the actual doctrines and the culture. So when we can hold up like why this would be so important for our, our community and our culture, and when it's led by people that are within the culture, I think that's when it's authentic. I, I, I love being in a position to share information, but I'm not the, the social change marker of your community. I actually believe all of you on this call are. So when you can be the ones that feel confident going into these difficult conversations um, and not expecting perfection, you're not gonna get a solution to child sexual abuse in one day. Uh, if that was true, we wouldn't have the issues we have right now. But if you're willing to go in with a full heart and engage and listen to each other, um, I think you can make really big change. Those days of dialogue I put on in Los Angeles were really powerful for just meeting people where they're at, hearing their fears, um, spreading some information, but also just hearing what they felt the solutions were and making community part of the solution. I think that's the way to go forward without stamping on discrediting or ignoring cultural identity and cultural beliefs. Oh, thank Mark. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I think, you know, some of the most difficult cases I've dealt with uh, either directly or indirectly have involved a child, a child abuse perpetrated within the family or by like a close family, extended family member where the issues are really complex. Like the family does not want to engage in prosecution. The family does not want the person to be locked up forever. You know, the, the father is abusing the, a daughter and the daughter still loves her father, just wants the abuse to stop, but doesn't want her father to be taken away from the family. And those are so difficult and complex in the systems we've created. So there's, it's just really important not to try and put a one size fits all approach on the issue of sexual violence because it is it has such intimacies and complexities that you can't just have a blanket statement. 
um, you can't have a zero tolerance policy um, because when you do that, you actually shut down real change. In my work in child sexual abuse, uh, one of the, the stories I come back to is uh, the National Child Sexual Abuse Hotline, you know, 30, 40 years ago was open to people that had urges or perpetrated sexual abuse, as well as to people that were victims of sexual abuse. And during that time, people that had these urges or had caused this harm, but wanted to change it, would come forward to the hotline and try and seek help. But when we created the mandatory reporting laws, what we in effect did is we shut down that avenue for people that were having these issues. And we know that child sexual abuse can be a power and control dynamic. We know there's also different forms of pedophilia that are related. You know, there's been studies that some are related to certain head traumas, that there's, there's different reasons or things that could be going on when people are attracted to younger um, prepubescent humans and when they cause harm to children. I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying that this is not an easy, an easy topic. And there's not just one type of uh, person who causes uh, child sexual abuse harm. But what we did when we created the structures we have is we inadvertently shut down the conversation in how we could prevent that abuse from happening, even if people had urges or were about to cause that kind of harm. Um, so then the hotline stopped seeing once it became their mandatory reporting laws, once the, the legal system was set up in the way it is, people that could cause harm or did cause harm did not seek help anymore. In fact, they tried to cover their tracks and tried to hide from help um, even more. So it's a really hard piece. That's what I struggle with is around the child sexual abuse because it's so complicated. It's not, it's complicated with family love and attachment. And that's much more uh, gray and difficult than just a stranger that has assaulted or hurt you. Um, there are, I did get a question about programs curriculum for addressing and teaching consent with children of different ages. I really like the darkness to light um, website. I am not sure. Let me, let, I'll write, I'll write it in the chat, darkness to light. And I think the website's www.d2l.org. Um, they have comprehensive resources around preventing child sexual abuse. And one of the important pieces of this is teaching consent at a young age, Con teaching consent and boundaries and the, the communication and the language around that to young people. And then also teaching adults and caregivers and trusted folks in the community to listen to that. A lot of things around sexual assault is a lot of times people might say something, but because we don't want to get involved or it's just too complicated or that person would never do that, we often ignore the, the disclosure or the call for help. Did I get everything, Shelby? <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy that there were significant um, follow-up questions too, because I'm hoping that this helps, although I don't have all the answers, I hope I can point you towards some resources. Um, you're doing a great job with the text chat. In case you were wondering, I just double checked. <laughs> it's not my it's not my my roundhouse. It's not my best best place. Um, and I would also just say about the continuum of harm slide that that exists for children to, that exists across the lifespan. So what I see working in elementary schools, I work in a lot of elementary schools now. 
is I see a lot of this inappropriate jokes, inappropriate language, um, even things that young kids may not understand, but they're mimicking older siblings' behavior, what they see on TV or with technology. Um, and so you can see that same sort of scale. And with what I do, I'm constantly interrupting, calling it out, naming it, but the other teachers and staff around the students don't necessarily have those skills. So we need to make sure that teachers, staff, and adults around young people know how to call out that behavior in a way that doesn't just shame and shut down, but calls people in to a conversation. Um, I also think that it is really important that we keep technology as central in this. I think that there's a tech abuse web conference coming in this series, and I know I'm doing some stuff on telehealth, but making sure we understand what young people and all people are consuming through video games, through their phones, through access to the internet, and what impact that has on their bodies, their expectations. Um, young boys that watch high levels of pornography have unrealistic expectations of what sex looks like, what consent looks like, um, and it becomes distorted in a way. And that can lead to maybe not purposeful, but inadvertent abuse and harm, inability to read, understand consent and understand boundaries, and an inability to be able to talk about sexual activity because they've just been exposed to all this sexual activity without kind of any dialogue or conversation about it. It's just been a one way um, place. So really making sure that we as adults with children with access to, te to technology um, teach children how to consume that and to listen to their gut if something doesn't seem right or doesn't seem good to walk away from it and to get help. Um, the least how we, if we can reduce our judgment and our punitive response so that young people can learn, I think we can really make a change in how we um, build expectations around the consumption of technology, especially graphic sexual content. And I love what Margaret said that it's a learned behavior because the great thing about that is it can be unlearned. So prevention is not, uh, sexual violence is not inevitable. It is a learned behavior. And so what is learned can be unlearned. And that gives us the chance to really create the communities we want to be in. Okay, I have another question um, wanting to address reporting to police and how um, it's not really that much of a prevention strategy. Yes, so in, in our history, uh, I'm very familiar with the California history, advocates history, and it follows, um, it has influenced the Violence Against Women Act and you know, various pieces around criminal justice engagement. And what's important to consider with the criminal justice system is that folks in the criminal justice system have a different interest. They're interested in upholding the law and providing accountability for people that violate the law. Advocates are in it to support survivors, not to uphold the law, not to do an investigation and figure out what really happened, but just to be there to support survivors, to listen to them and to share an empowerment approach, which means advocates are not in, a, in the victims, the non-governmental victims advocates or folks that are just supporting survivors are not the investigators. 
But, you know, in criminal law engagement has been our first line of response in how we respond to sexual violence. It can, in, in theory, it can prevent maybe future victimization if a person is actually convicted. When you look at the numbers of people that are actually convicted for sexual violence versus the reported cases, it's like less than 1%. It is, it is not a prevention strategy as such. It's not preventing sexual violence. And many people that perpetrate sexual violence do not say they were worried about the criminal justice consequences because honestly, the consequences aren't there at the highest level. Um, another piece is it's not getting to the core issue. Putting more people in prison has not ended child sexual abuse. Uh, the problem is that people are still becoming people that perpetrators, people that use abusive behaviors and, pe and people that are survivors or victims are still nervous, scared, shamed to come forward and, and report. So our prevention strategy has has engaged across different systems like the education system, like um, working with you know certain secular or interconnected um, agencies like the military, working within special groups to create strategies for their communities. Um, and the criminal justice system is it can be is has a one has one specific goal towards uh, the upholding of laws as the enforcement of laws and, and the, the creation of accountability, which is not everything that prevention is. Does that, does that help? I'm not sure if, if anyone wants to ask a follow-up or um, go further, I hope I kind of getting the answer <laughs> in the ballpark. Do know I will will get these PowerPoints to you. I'll include a video slide at the end with all the videos on it, so you can access them as well. Hopefully, supporting you in your community education, outreach, and your work with survivors. And since folks were really interested in prevention, I'm just gonna write in uh, the, the chat, preventconnect.org, great thing, glistserv to join, to talk about these kind of things. Plus they have a lot of archived web conference, uh, blogs, uh, webinars and materials. And thank you, Taylor, for putting that in. Thank you, everyone. I hope to see many of you back um, when I'm presenting later on in the series and be sure and bring your questions. All of my presentations have my similar philosophies tied in and really wanna bring this trauma-informed lens to everything we do here at Cal Casa and beyond.
And can I just give a shout out to our, our sign language team? I hope I went slow enough. <laughs> Thank you. I cannot imagine. And just to shout out, I think you're do, having the restorative justice, uh, exploring alternative ways of achieving justice for sexual assault survivors in criminal justice system next, tomorrow, if I'm correct, Shelby. And that's a great place to talk about that intersection with criminal justice and why it is difficult for survivors. Um, and it's difficult to be an advocate in that role where you're trying to support survivors that's a different role from law enforcement and criminal justice. And thanks, Taylor put up the link to the CEUs. Stay safe and please, um, I hope you join us for the rest of the series as well. Thank you, Emily. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, it is now 11.30 your time um, and 5.30 our time. So I'll go ahead and end the session and hope to see you all tomorrow or on another one of our the series. Have a great rest of your day.